Capsi Podcast Series, Conversations on African Philanthropy. So the next session that we are doing now is going to be, I'm really excited. And I think what Olera said really stayed a lot with me when she said that um, having the social compact is going to depend on a strong leader. And Olera, I want to expand it to say strong leadership. Yeah, strong leadership. And the last question just before we started was asking about leadership within the philanthropy sector. So I think it's just transitioned us very well to this one. So um, I'm going to hand over to Peggy, who is the adjunct professor at the Vets Business School. If you think of African philanthropy and thought leadership, the first name that comes to mind is Peggy. Yeah? I knew him as an entry-level uh, manager in the NGO sector. He still looks the same. It was like... <laughs> 15 years ago, and philanthropy, everyone thought Peggy and, and thought like leadership around philanthropy. So he is uh, currently the director of the Center on African Philanthropy and Social Investment, which is CAPSI, so he's really continued. Um, most people, when we think of, I was just being introduced to someone here from the Southern African Trust, and I was like, yo, Peggy. So we remember him also from there. So Peggy's going to lead us in the next session up until uh, tea. Just to say that we are aware that we are running a few minutes late, so tea is going to be about 15 to 20 minutes late. We really want to give them the time that we we had said we'll give them. So can we just clap hands and hand over to Peggy. Thank you so much. I mean, we, we negotiated with the pastor that uh, we're going to record this as, an, as a conversation for one of the podcasts that we do at CAPSI. So this is going to be done in collaboration uh, with the pastor. Um, so I wanted to start there because it, if you see the guys running around with cameras and stuff, it's because we want to make this one of our annual uh, you know, versions of the conversations that we have. So we're going to start. Uh, welcome everyone to this special conversation on African uh, philanthropy. Thank you, thank you for joining the ninth IPASA Symposium. Uh, what a milestone. I think most institutions and, in, and initiatives don't make it to 10 years. Uh, and for a pastor to be doing this for the ninth uh, time is a milestone. I wanted to make sure that we clear hands for a pastor. Uh, and I think the time is apt for us to reflect uh, on bold philanthropy and what it looks like. I think in the earlier sessions, we were already beginning to define that, but we want to give it expression here through the two leaders that we have uh, in front. Uh, so what does bold philanthropy look like? What does bold leadership in philanthropy look like? And what does it not look like? So let us have that courageous conversation so we can ignite action. So please help me welcome Judy Lamini. Judy is the founder and executive chairperson of Mbegani Group. Judy is also the chancellor of Vets University. I think you do have the bios in your packs, and so I'm not going to go through everything. But safe to say that Judy is one of the most experienced and qualified leaders of our time, serving on various roles in leadership and governance structures uh, across sectors, but also across disciplines. I also want to welcome Janet Jobson. Janet is the CEO of the Desmond and Leah Tutu Legacy Foundation. She re recently served as the uh, deputy CEO and acting D uh, uh, CEO of the DG Murray Trust. Once again, you have the resume in your pack. Uh, she's been in several governance and activism roles. Welcome, Judy. Welcome, Janet. Judy, let's start with you. Uh, what does bold leadership look like and how does it express itself in your philanthropic interventions? For, for, I mean, for most of us, we've followed your journey, uh, setting up the Mbegani Group, but also some philanthropic initiatives. For example, the Future Nation Schools that we co-founded, this FISO Learning Group, as well as the Mkiwa Trust. But I think one of your recent initiatives is the um, Female Academic Field uh, um, uh, leaders Fellowship. 
help us understand um, how you managed to do all of this. Surely you needed to tap into your bold leadership and, and courageous leadership. What did bold mean to you at the time? Thanks, thanks very much, Peggy, and uh, thanks uh, for inviting uh, us, um, and good morning. Um, it's actually quite interesting because those who know me will be like, no, Judy can't be sitting there talking about philanthropy because uh, I'm a baby when it comes to so-called philanthropy. And I'll explain that. You know, I always say when I talk to Peggy that in Africa, philanthropy is a way of being. It's a way of life. You are raised giving from what you have, and you continue to give from what you have, right? So you, you do it without thinking that it has a name. You do it because that's what people do, you know? And uh, so that's how I was raised, that's what I did. I got married to someone who was raised the same way, so we continue to do it. So for me, what does it really mean? It means that when you see that there is a challenge, even before you become an anointed leader with a title, you do something about it. And the something that you do tries to be systemic. And I always use education as that example, which is systemic, because you pay for a child to go to university or even a good school, and that's a game changer, not just for the child, not just for that family, but for that community. Because all of a sudden there's a CA from that village and there's a doctor from that village. That is systemic change in my view. And um, what does it mean then in leadership? It's more responsibility. But you know what I find interesting is that we are so focused on titles, job descriptions, you know, and we forget that leadership is bigger than that. Leadership is about bringing systemic change and uh, taking risk and making sure that you galvanize people around the cause. So uh, I have to say this one quickly before I, I give over to my colleague. Um, you know, when I became a chancellor, you spoke about FAL, Female Academic Leaders Fellowship, because it's the baby. You know, a last born always gets all the attention and it's very close to your heart. They still cure trust amongst other things. But um, I didn't, you know, it's a minister without portfolio, if you like, because it's really a ceremonial role. So it's easy for people to think, oh, then the responsibility is showing up for graduation ceremonies. But the beauty with the roles like that and the beauty with owning leadership and you chart your own path is that you bring the whole of who you are because you are like, I can't have a title and have nothing to show for it. But whatever it is that you have to show for it has to be informed by the need on the ground. And what is the need? And then when I say you bring the whole of you, I'm driven about achieving equality across all social identities, you know? I know uh, Nikki is big on the intersectional feminist lens when you look at challenges. So I just thought, okay, I'm inquisitive. I'll do research in the space because it wasn't my space. And I, I discovered that We've done a lot of work, we've poured a lot of money and effort, but we've always looked at one social identity at a time. And what does that do? It means someone who looks like me, who has a, no single identity of privilege, gets left behind. And that's black women, right? And I was like, okay, this is what I'm going to focus on. And I was very quick to get a, a mentor who will tell me, careful, overreach, <laughs> not overreach, because people are quite territorial. Uh, so uh, I'm comfortable that uh, I have someone who, who guides me around that space. For now, I think I'll stop there. Thank you, Judy. I think I, I want to, uh, there's something that you said to me in one of our conversations that for you, 
every decade is a decade of learning. Um, so you started off as a medical doctor, you went into business, and uh, your recent, um, I think, engagement is being trained as a teacher. Uh, so Judy is a teacher now. <laughs> so I think I really wanted us to use that as one of the entry points into discussing, you know, what enables bold leadership and what becomes a barrier. Why is every decade a learning decade for you? Thanks for that uh, important question, uh, Peggy. I, I think humility helps because humility says, I don't know. You enter a space and you realize, damn, I don't know. And I've always believed that everything can be learned. Almost everything can be learned. And uh, I, I quite, I'm passionate about actual education with a certificate by people who know. So I tend to follow that route. So when uh, Sisu and I started the schools, uh, we did a lot of research. And uh, one of the things that's critical, uh, I know I'm talking to people who know more than I do, um, you know, is the teacher. The teacher is the pillar of education. And understanding how they are trained, what they learn, are they prepared enough for the job that they do, what are the challenges they encounter? You then become a teacher. Because then you talk at the same level, you understand their issues, and you can help together with them to solve for those issues. But the other thing that I learned is that, you know, when you enter any space, you come from a point of not knowing, and you make sure that you learn the space, you learn from the people. And um, one of the things that I love saying is that the beauty with humility is that even the person who is just serving tea in an institution that you've just entered that you don't understand, they know so much. They have so much context. I was once in the business of luxury fashion, and we would have those uh, security officers uh, at the door uh, who you would think, ah, they wouldn't know anything. But you know, when you mess up, people leave the store and they complain to that person, and they are a reservoir of knowledge. So our stretch sessions would have all of them, the cleaner, the security officer. So I guess what I'm saying is, be humble enough to share your vulnerabilities, what you don't know, and do something about it. And learning is one of the best things to do that. Thank you so much. And uh, as when we were preparing for this session, we actually touched a lot, Janet, on uh, leading from the point of vulnerability. And that for most of us, when we see the word bold and courageous, we are thinking of you know, masculine uh, you know, processes. But actually, the best leaders so far in the world have led from the point of vulnerability. And we saw during the time of COVID that the ones that made the best decisions were female leaders who accepted that they were vulnerable. And those that went on to put on military fatigue and others actually did not do very well. So coming to you, Janet, um, let's, talk, let's reflect also further on this idea of bold leadership, especially given that you are in the shadows of one of the iconic leaders uh, in the world. Uh, but maybe let's start with you serving as uh, a part of leadership in the DJ Marie Trust but also in your current um, experience, what does bold leadership look like for you? Thanks, Becky. Um, yeah, I love putting vulnerability at the heart of, of leadership. There's a fantastic uh, quote that I often hold with me, um, which says, the quality of the intervention depends on the interior condition of the intervener. And I think it's really, really important that so much of our conversation about leadership depends on what the work is we're doing internally. Um, and one of the great things I've, I've had the last sort of year and a bit at the Tutu Legacy Foundation, really studying the leadership of the arch. Um, and that, that process of putting contemplation, putting the self-work, putting the reflection on your own being, how you are, where you are, um, I think is such a critical example that he gives the world. I was thinking, um, 
one of the other things I really take from him, when, when, when he became Archbishop of Cape Town, he said his, he had a three things on his agenda. Uh, fix the administration of the church, um, get women ordained as priests, and defeat apartheid. <laughs> and, and what I find so inspiring about that is that um, you're able to com combine multiple layers of influence and leadership at the same time. So on the one hand, fix what's within your immediate control, your organization, the way you work, how everything is administered, uh, the efficiency and effectiveness with which everything is done in your name. But then where do you have real control over fundamental change in your ecosystem? He had it to get women ordained as priests. But there's many ways in which, as philanthropies, we've got real power and real control to shift some things. And we should be bold enough to do that. And then really importantly, to have a massive vision. <laughs> a vision of a kind of change that doesn't just take you, but that which you have to play a really, really critical part of. And I think often um, the call for bold leadership is a call to have a bolder vision of what you're contributing to, not just um, sort of taking step by step a path through supporting civil society, but really asking what is the bold change that South Africa needs now. And I think there were a lot of hints in the session earlier today as to what's needed, but really trying to position um, your influence and your leadership at once organizationally and at the same time societally. And I think there's a real need for societal leadership um, you know, we've all been celebrating Siakulisi and, and the Springboks, and one of the comments that's been coming a lot is, we've got incredible leaders in South Africa, they're just not our politicians. Um, and, and I think that's true in civil society as well. There's incredible leadership in civil society, but it's not as vocal as it could be, um, and it's not actively participating at the decision-making table in the way that it could be. And so I think there is a a need for a boldness in stepping forward on all of the issues that you work on into spaces of real societal leadership and societal influence. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> but I also, want to, I also want to hear your reflections on your own personal experiences, uh, especially in the governance structures that you have served in, as well as the leadership structures. What have been some of the limiting um, or barriers for you expressing bold leadership, but also what have been some of the enabling factors that you can share with the audience? Thanks, Becky. Um, yeah, I'm not young anymore, but I, I used to be quite a young person in, um, well, officially by the definitions of South Africa. It's a traumatic thing to leave behind. Um, but being quite young in, in the civil society sector, and, and I started out... Um, my first board position was when I was 19 on the board of Amnesty International South Africa, and I was thrown in the deep end because there was a, a massive conflict uh, at which I was put at the heart. <laughs> it was probably the best learning experience I could have had to, to grow up very quickly and deal with the complexities of, um, of conflict at an organizational level, but really, really daunting. And I think I've been really lucky um, throughout my career to have mentors and champions that have thrown me in the deep end, um, that have really given me a sense of trust in my capability um, to take, yeah, to take really big steps and to try really big things. And I think that's something I tried to model as well in, in my leadership within DGMT was what is the space that people have to define their work in a way that they can bring their full selves to it. Um, and, and then what is, and, and then I do think this question of, of what is the role of our organizations in society? Um, you know, I, I, I've spent most of my time at DGMT helping to start up something called the Activate Leadership Network. And Activate's now about four and a half thousand young people across the country, all driving change from a community level to a national level. And part of what we're trying to do there is really position every individual as having a massive contribution to play to society. No matter where you are, whether you're in a village context, whether you're in a corporate setting, what is the work each of us can contribute to? And how do we, how do we get a bigger vision of what that is? So a lot of the leadership I'm trying to bring, particularly into governance positions, is about challenging the, lead, the societal questions um, that we have to grapple with, not just the day-to-day -day work 
that we all get done, but what does it mean for our society and how do we contribute to being the, the weaver society, um, I love that, that analogy, um, in how we lead internally and externally. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, uh, last week we attended uh, the third year anniversary of the Ford Foundation in Southern Africa, and Lindwe Masbogo said the re recent uh, Afroparometer study is showing that young people are actually interested in leadership that won't emerge from elections. Um, and, I, and I think that seems to be something that is resonating in the room now. And uh, Judy, I want to talk to you, I mean, without taking away from other initiatives, but let's focus on the last one, the, the FARF. Um, what is it that you wanted to, to achieve? I mean, the, the, the higher education sector is, is already complex, but you come in and you realize there's a gap and you want to make an impact. So let's talk a bit about far of what your vision was, uh, where it is now, and some of the successes that we can already share uh, with the audience. Thanks very much, Peggy. Um, I, I, it always starts with self. I became a medical doctor because I saw one. He looked like me. I wanted to be him. And uh, I did a PhD because I saw someone who looks like me being one of a few, and I wanted it. So I think when I then get to the universities and see these many young black girls who are really doing well, who are high in numbers when it comes to the junior degrees, post-grad, even the masters and the PhDs, it's, you know, it's going the right direction. But when I look at all 26 universities and I look at the leadership and I look at the professors and the associate professors, they don't look like me. And yet, we are looking for young, intelligent brains to enter academia, to do research that is relevant for this country and this continent. And for us to be able to do that, we need to create role models. They can, they can, they can see themselves and make it accessible. So what did that entail? So a lot of research, getting academics who are clever, who understand the space to be on the board, uh, put a bit of money, which wasn't enough. Obviously, I knew that, but I'd never raised funds before. So I couldn't rely on funds that I might not be able to get. But I worked on the belief that the little that I have, if it just changes uh, for uh, women, it should be better. So what are we trying to achieve? We are saying to young Actually, not only young, because that's, the other, that's a conversation for another day. But black women, especially the African and Africans of mixed descent or coloreds, uh, there are so many names and it resonates with different people, the title that we give, but that's the history of our country. But um, because they are not showing up when it comes to professorship, associate professor, dean of uh, faculty, heads of school and so forth. We then did an analysis and said, okay, with your help, tell us what it is that you require to get to that position, senior lecturer and that position. Sometimes it's research, I need funds for doing research, or I need money to complete the PhD, or I need access, uh, I actually need to go and present uh, in an international conference. So all the deliverables that are put in place uh, to influence the motion of, of uh, uh, academic uh, leaders is what we're solving for. So we offer grants for that. But the other area that's important to us because there is a deliberate reason why we have leadership in the title we are developing a pipeline of leaders. It's not just about being a professor, it's not just about being a chair of a research chair, but it's about leadership of self to be able to lead others. So one of the first things that we do, we assess the leadership strengths and weaknesses of each fellow, and uh, it's done by someone who's experienced, who does that, and then we have a workshop to help you to build your leadership skills. But not only do we do that, we also believe, and this is Prof. Stellangomo's uh, uh, belief, that 
uh, there is value in peer-to-peer -peer mentorship. When you're struggling, especially in minorities in certain areas, you find that you feel like you are alone in the struggle. But when you become a collective and share your tactics to deal with the hostile environment, uh, then you become stronger. All of a sudden, it looks like a place like this is home. So we have uh, what we call pods. Prof. Stella came up with that. So we pair the fellows into three to five uh, in a group. We try to make sure that it's people from different disciplines because there's strength in bringing different disciplines together because the thinking is different. And what has come out of that, interestingly, is that some of the pods are actually doing research together, conducting research, powerful research that is multidisciplinary. What have we achieved? It was 2019 when we did the research, 2020, we legalized five. 2021 was the first cohort of 30, then the following year, 16, and 2023, uh, 25. So we now have 73 fellows, female academic leaders that are progressing from, some of them are associate professors, some of them have gone to senior leadership, that's one. Two, it's now home, in spite of the challenges, because you will not believe just how much universities are siloed. You actually have a symposium, and you have these people that work for the same institution who meet each other for the first time, because we are in silos. So part of the rationale is to break those silos. So I am very grateful because that two rand that I put in was multiplied. And it's interesting, I was thinking sitting there that it's interesting that it's women actually who came and said, here's money. Yeah. You know, right? There she is, Nikki Leru, Vuiswa, and um, uh, Rebecca Oppenheimer, uh, Mbumi from Bidvest. They just said, go and do what you have to do. Now we've proved the concept, right? And our weaver work, Olelua, is to become national, right? To, because there's a need. You know, as I said, even the NRF now has given us fund. Again, Ford Foundation came and said, we'll support this initiative, a research chair on gender-based violence and femicide, which will be based at WITS, right? 2024. The one that I can't give details of names for because the letter hasn't come is a research chair on entrepreneurship. Going back to the challenge we face as a country, for me, it, it breaks my heart that economic inequality has my face on it, and that has to change. And our young people, uh, Kaya, instead of looking for job, let's l help them create the jobs because that's how we're going to grow this economy. So we are receiving that funding, also 2024, and the beauty, it won't be at VITS, sorry VITS, not because, <laughs> but it will be at an institution that is, that needs more support. So we, we, we're doing well, and uh, uh, I'm not in PR, uh, but, uh, <laughs> but it, it won't hurt if you help us to go to all 26 institutions, because this inequality that is black and mostly female is not sustainable. It just isn't. And each one of us has to do something as a collective to change the status quo. Thank you. Thank you. I think lots of challenges. One is uh, for the philanthropic sector is, you know, uh, for, how do we use FALF as an example in case study to make the philanthropic sector look like us? Um, how do we build the leadership in the philanthropic sector so that we can see ourselves uh, in the sector? So I think that's one big challenge. The second is the whole notion of staying consistent uh, in supporting a particular issue that requires structural changes. 
Um, I think you referred to the Ford Foundation. They just use it as an example. It's been supporting social justice in this region for 71 years, uh, in this region, since 1952. Uh, and they have not shifted the, the attention. And there are many others who are doing uh, something similar. Janet, you are described as um, you know, um, using the example of uh, Desmond and Leah to, to actually build new courageous uh, leaders. I wanted to get a sense if, if we can go deeper into how you are doing that, um, you know, for the, for, especially for this sector. So we're, um, yeah, I've sort of, sort of had the real opportunity to think deeply about leadership from the perspective of someone like the Arch, and we felt what we needed to do was to bring together the most diverse cohorts possible, <laughs> whether that's profession, race, uh, class, location, um, and build in a cohort of, of young people, in particular young professionals mostly, a sense of what it takes to lead for humanity, um, to really lift one's eyes from the horizon, to do the self-work, to do one's organizational work, but then to think about what is leading for humanity require of us. And it requires a, um, it's been such an interesting learning journey walking uh, with the cohort because um, there are so many different spaces and places in which the internal work has actually led to real outcomes in terms of the practicality of how people lead. I think often it's, um, it's the, the soft stuff that we don't like to, we don't know how to quantify, but it's, it's probably the piece that has had the most impact is the depth of internal work that we've done with that cohort and that they've done with each other. Um, I think part of what South Africa needs in, in building a, a Weaver nation is a new social capital, is a social capital that um, really can rebuild society from a diversity of perspectives, but interconnected at the same time. And I think trying to bring really diverse cohorts together is critical uh, to doing that kind of work. I'm, I'm reminded... Um, you know, one of, one of my big passions at DGMT and, and that I still sort of really guides me is how do we understand the full human beings that we work with? Um, and it, it strikes me often that in our work in civil society and philanthropy, we, we tend to divide people up into their different identities. So we have an ECD program and we have a youth program and we never speak about the fact that the parents of the ECD kids are the young people who are unemployed and are being targeted by the youth employment program. Um, or that the schooling program um, is the same, you know, it's the same cohort as people you might be engaging with through a gender-based violence program. Um, and there's something about building a, a leadership that comes to the question of how we make change from the question of the totality of our humanity that I think is really, really crucial in this time because we aren't just boxes. Um, we are complicated human beings living in complicated human systems. And the only way to really shift that is to get a deep, deep understanding of the individual and the collective at the same time. And to start to, to pull those opportunities at the intersections through in more deliberate ways. Thank you. Um, those of us that study social movements, uh, one of the things I think you have said and you have mentioned it, if you look at where you can get the best strategies to undo um, issues of structural in inequity, etc. You have to look into women's struggles and how they actually developed strategies to actually undo that. And so I was actually, um, uh, in a way, intrigued when you said the people that supported FARV were all women. And it took me back to some of these studies where if you really want to take a look at how um, you know, issues of oppression and others have been dealt with it look no further than the women's movement. We have five minutes to, to learn because we actually did not have enough time. I just want to make sure that the, if there are one or two questions from the audience, uh, we take those two and then we'll close the session. Anyone with a question? Okay, I don't see any hands, so I think we've, we, we, okay, there's one there. Thank you so much, so much to absorb. Um, 
the point, point that you made, Judy, I think was around um, coming from a point of not knowing. And um, as, as one gains more and more experience, um, everything that you do is loaded with that experience, right? And so how does one practically um, kind of rejig your mind so that you can look at something with a very fresh perspective and actually come to something from a point of not knowing when, when you do bring a lot of knowledge about it? Um, and that knowledge can really bias how you look at a challenge. Um, maybe, is there any other question? If not, um, Judy, as you respond, and Janet, uh, what would be your key um, messages to the audience so that the symposium can think about as we go to the 10th iteration of the symposium, especially around what bold leadership should look like in philanthropy? Thanks very much. Uh, I didn't get your name. Sonia. Sonia. Uh, thanks very much, Sonia. Before I answer your name, as much has to be mentioned, Kuseni Lamini, otherwise it'll be like, you talk about women, you don't recognize me. <laughs> uh, you know, you raise an important point because you always bring something, right? You might n come from a point of not knowing what happens in the space, but you always bring something to the party. But what is important is to know that there are gaps in that whatever it is that you bring. And how do you make sure that you learn the people? And the people that you enter the space that they've always been in are your resource. And I like saying this several times because we are snotty in this country. You know, we were raised to believe that a certain race is less a certain gender is less, a certain social class is less. As a result, we, we have this hierarchical way of seeing and being. So you think you only will get the information from the board members or the executives. So you actually will learn whatever space you get into by assessing all the people, all the levels and understand where they're coming from, what their challenges are, and then that for me is knowledge. I hope I've answered you. So you always, of course, I love studying, but it's not all in the book. A lot of it is with you, the people that you encounter. They know a lot. Till you ask them, you won't know. So that's my take. And what I would like to say, uh, there's something, I think it's Chriselle, who actually answered you, uh, Mabato, uh, to say, why don't we have a seat at the table when it comes to these challenges? And I think you need to grab that seat, you know, and be part of the main challenges. And look, I'm passionate about education. I'm passionate about gender issues. So I'm going to be inclined towards that space because one of the panelists also spoke about a, it will be just the founders, actually it was a question from the floor, the founders a pet subject, right? But when you come as a collective and there is leadership accountability from government because when you say we have the funds, we want to help, but give us the top four, right? And in the room, uh, who's doing what? Where is the gap? Who, which area is being neglected? And how do we sort out that gap? Because if we are going to be a weaver work nation, we need to do that and be accountable ourselves to say, this is what we committed to. These are the four objectives. What's happening three years later? What's happening five years later? I just think it's quite simple, but when you make life simple, it becomes easier for ordinary people like myself. Thanks. Thank you. Um, yeah, just jotting down some, some, some final thoughts. I mean, I think my biggest challenge to everyone in the philanthropy sector is to really ask this question of how do you lead for humanity? How do you really raise your eyes from the horizon of your, your grant or the one organization or the few organizations to a question of what is your contribution to society as a whole? And how do you 
really give voice to that. I think um, we now need, we need leadership from a variety of sectors more, more now than we have ever. Um, and there is something really, really powerful about having the bird's eye view that a philanthropist has um, of working with multiple, multiple organizations across multiple issues that does give you an insight into society which you should share um, and which you should be willing to speak very powerfully up to government, up to the business sector, really um, hold, hold each other and hold the different sectors to account. Um, I think there's an, an enormous need to invest in young talent within your organizations and within, within the organizations you fund. Um, I think we've seen in civil society that there's a wave of founder leaders who are moving out of the organizations that they created in the 80s and 90s. And we need a new wave of incredible young leaders to step into those organizations in partnership with philanthropy. Um, and I think there's an enormous opportunity to think about how you invest in leadership within the sector and within yourselves. And then probably most important for me um, is that how you do things matters. Um, what you do is really, really important, but how you do it, the, the extent to which you really recognize the full humanity of the people you work with, the people who your organizations that you fund work with, the ways in which you think about um, to what extent you're reinforcing divides or closing divides in our society. The way in which we work is as important as what we do, and we really, really need to place that at the heart of how we think about social change. Thank you, thank you so much. As I see Nofundo coming up, uh, I want to summarize by saying if there's anything that I think for us as the sector, and that's what we're trying to do with the two panelists here, is, is, is to draw from our, our insight. Um, all of us have been doing things in the past. What is it that we have learned there that helps us to, to be courageous and be very bold leaders, but also to build on the insights that we have. Currently, all of us here have lots of insights. But what we don't have a lot of is foresight. And so if we can think about those three, the insight, the insights, and the foresight in thinking about leadership, because at the end of it all, this bold and courageous leadership should be about the future, especially for the children. And I think, I think that was raised a long time ago. Thank you for joining. Uh, let's uh, give our panelists a good hand of thanks. Wow. Can you just clap hands for our panelists and thank you, Peggy, for leading this. Whew. There is so much to digest, so much. I don't know about you, my, um, we usually say that for us to be successful leaders, we need to connect to all different levels of intelligence, our head space, our gut space, and our heart. Yeah? So I, I just, there's so much happening for me at all these levels. And we'd like to just invite you as we're going to go for tea break. We're gonna have a 30 minute tea break. I want you to just sit in whatever. Don't just even think in your head. Just sit in what's happening in your body. Yeah? We underestimate the intelligence that our sensations and our feelings hold. What is it that has been stirred up for you from the previous session and also to this one. Um, what's really sitting with me is how do we create a weaver society? What, what does that take? And this presentation is saying, actually the greatest work is in the software. Yeah, how do we begin to do that? It's so easy to put on projects, ECD, e these, you know, and write the projects. But the messiness is the one that is going to create the Hadida society that we are talking about. And, and let's step into it, yeah? Let's not sit in what is comfortable for us. Let's sit in what is uncomfortable, in, 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 in areas that we are not used to, into places we haven't been to, if we're gonna create, because the kind of society that we want. The, the way we are working now as a society is not sustainable. Something needs to shift. And it's exciting to hear that the leadership and the internal work of leadership is going to lead us to where we need to go. You've been listening to the CAPSI podcast series, Conversations on African Philanthropy.